never came to preach religion and tradition. He came to preach the kingdom. Amen. And sadly, you know, we all grow and we all learn and we all see things differently. But I, I think the vast majority, and I'm making a global statement, have not done a good job of representing the kingdom of God. We've come in with rules, regulations, jump through hoops, do that, do that, do that. You can't go to point B before you do point A, all this nonsense. But Jesus said, hey, there's a kingdom I want to talk to you about, and I want to reveal this kingdom to you, and I want to teach you how to function within this kingdom. Jesus never said, uh, say the sinner's prayer. He said, follow me. I feel, I feel if there's religion here today... I'm not going to be liked. But he never. And I, I, want, to, I want to share a few things this morning. Amen. We started a, a kingdom series uh, called The Kingdom Way. If you, if you haven't heard it, last week was part two. The week before was part one. Because you do part two after part one. So it's logic. That's what part one was two weeks back. Um, but I want to encourage you to go and, and back and listen. Because it's not going to make sense if you don't see the full picture. Amen. Because often we take pieces and we try to build a doctrine out of it and we build our whole life out of a bias we create out of one zone instead of getting a big picture. And until we see the big picture, we're not going to be able to operate in the kingdom in an effective way. And so the first, first week I, I spoke about understanding the kingdom and we spoke about it being all inclusive. In other words, hey, if you're a Catholic and you believe in Jesus, you're in. I told you it's going to ruffle some feathers this morning. All right. Uh, if you're a prostitute and you believe in Jesus and you've repented, you're in. Right? If you're a Pentecostal and you believe in Jesus, you're in. <laughs> I'm going to have fun with this today. But, but you're in. It's all inclusive, right? We spoke about the part of the kingdom, understanding it, the righteousness, peace, and joy are fruits and evident in the kingdom. Okay? And the third thing we spoke about on, on understanding the kingdom is that it is now and it is to come. We're, the kingdom is here present, but it is also coming in its fullness. And we have to understand how to cooperate in both of it because it affects our mindset and it affects everything we do. If, if, we, if we're living in the it's coming, we don't live taking today serious. But if all we do is live in it's now without taking the future serious, we're not taking people with us. We're living for self. And so if we understand it is now and it is to come, we're going to live completely different. Uh, the second uh, part we looked at is how it functions. It starts with a mustard seed. It starts with a word which is a mustard seed. It, it starts small, it gets deposited, and it has the potential to grow into a, a harvest within our lives. Amen. And the second part of that, we looked at the, the Holy Spirit it, it forms part of the photosynthesis process. In other words, he, he's the light that brings life to the seed, the mustard seed that gets put in us. And so you can hear a lot of stuff. You can listen. I'm all for study, but you can go to Bible school and spend your life doing a four-year degree and not have the Spirit of God illuminate what you've learned. And all you've got is knowledge, but no revelation which transforms. I did two bachelor degrees, took four years. And afterwards, the Lord said, now you're ready to get to know me. Talk about a four-year rebuke. Like, you couldn't you have told me that four years ago? No, because everything I learned was valuable. But I was, seeking, I was seeking two letters in front of my name, which is called doctor, because uh, I thought that opens doors until I realized it's the anointing and favor that opens doors, not a, not a title in front of your name. So I threw the business card of prophet, apostle, evangelist, pastor, doctor away, and now I just want to know I'm the beloved of the Most High, anointed, appointed of Him. Let that open doors. Amen. And so I'm all for study. The Bible says study, show yourself approved, understand the Word if we don't spend time in it. But let me tell you, until revelation, transformation doesn't come. But it's the Holy Spirit that helps us with that. Amen. And the third thing is that we need to understand that the kingdom of God functions through authority. <laughs> it's not a free for all. There's an authority that it functions in. And if we don't understand it starts with a seed empowered by the Holy Spirit, governed by an authority, you're not going to be able to function in it. Amen. Praise God. Give your neighbor a high five. 
I didn't say make the sound effects. I just said give them a high five. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Well, today we're going to talk about operating within it. Tell your neighbor, today you're going to know how to operate in it. Amen. Uh, but before we go there, I just, I just I heard a joke and I thought I, I got to share it. I don't share much jokes. I'm very serious usually. Usually very serious, right? But I heard this joke and I thought, well, why did Noah have to punish the chickens on the ark? Because they were using foul language. <laughs> I mean, talk about cheesy, right? Listen, that, I told you I'm going to get in religious spirits. You're allowed to laugh in church. Jesus ain't going to strike you. He's not going to ban you, okay? We need more jokes and laughing in church, amen? Some of you are very serious, amen? Can I have that image up? I, I don't know if I, if I did get it with a key. How awesome is that? You know what that has to do with my message today? Absolutely nothing. No, I'm kidding. It does, it does, it does. It, it's, it's, it's a good picture. But I, I'm going to talk about three keys today, three principles that will help you to understand how to function within the kingdom. The, the, first, the first thing is faith. Faith is the golden key that unlocks everything. And, and if you don't understand, and, and there's, there's fake and there's faith. There's faith in your own faith, but faith in the finished work of Christ, which one are you in? And it's easy to gauge. The moment somebody's faced with a situation, right, that is out of their control, that's where that kicks in to see whether they actually are people of faith or not. There's things I can say I have faith for when I'm in control of things, but the moment is out of my control, do I have faith in God? Do I have faith in the finished work of Jesus? And I really believe faith is the key that opens everything. Faith opens up fellowship. Okay, you, 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 you can't have, it's the entry point into the kingdom. You, you cannot have fellowship without faith. Right? That, 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 that's called um, being put into a, a white jacket and put into a room for therapy because you're talking to yourself. <laughs> no, you, just, don't, don't, don't switch off. It takes faith to have fellowship with somebody you can't see. Yeah. Come on, husbands and wives, sometimes you struggle to have fellowship and you're right in each other's presence. Come on, don't, don't look to them and don't nudge. Sit still. I saw nudging happening over there and I'm like, I, this is not, we're not doing marriage 101 today. We're talking about faith, okay? And you need faith to get through that, all right? But it's fellowship. The second thing is principles. Living according to God's ways. Living according to giving first. Off the top, before I pay my bills, requires faith and obedience. And not by law, out of love and grace. You know, uh, Pastor Megs and myself, we could, I, I, I was invited to um, a fundraising event Friday night. And I was like, oh, we had the men's thing on and I intended to be here. But I really felt compelled that we needed to go. And our neighbor, uh, Goldie's Caravans, was the major sponsor for an event that was held at Pack Fair at a restaurant, the Italian restaurant in the middle, uh, and Lifestyle Classic Magazine. So it was, it was a real corporate, secular fundraising event. But I really felt the Spirit of God saying to us, we need to be there. And I was like, Lord, like, you know, I need to be in church with our men. Um, but anyway, we ended up going, and, and we saw we saw we saw this fundraising event happening. My wife was in the middle of the cocktail floor in the dance area while everyone's having cocktails and stuff, and we're drinking our sparkling water. Right? I don't really care about your opinion. I'm having my sparkling water. I have the the new wine in me. Thank you. I don't need a glass of wine. I have the new wine in me. Amen. And, and so we're standing, and she's she's ministering to somebody. Right there, and she's in tears and, and like ministering to her heart. And I'm like, I said to her after, I said, Jesus wanted us here because this is the room he would have been in, ministering to these people, right? And, and people are walking up, and there's some, a lot of wealthy people there. I mean, they were like auctioning paintings for 20 grand, and the people were like, oh yeah, 20 grand, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one, I'll take that one, I'll take that one. And I'm like, I'm looking around, I'm going like, would you like to come to church? I'll auction something that's going to give you a far better picture for your life, right, than that, because that's ugly. Where are you going to put that thing, right? 
But I was thinking, but 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 yeah, these people with no blinking, nothing, nothing, just just sowing, giving into charity, into good causes. It was Vinny's feeding the homeless, and it was like awesome. And we met other charities there, met other corporates. People come up to me, and go, so uh, what? What do you do? I said, I pastor, and it's almost like like. <laughs> What word, can't, can't I be here? Is there a problem? <laughs> I was like, you know? But afterwards, we got a shout out uh, on, a, on a social media platform that has a reach of about 50,000 people. The church was mentioned. Uh, thank you for coming and being with us. Amen. And, and so we had kingdom impact. But, but it takes faith, right? To operate in principles that, that we don't understand in the natural, but it takes faith to respond to them. Amen. It takes faith to withdraw resources from the kingdom. It takes faith to commission angels to go. It takes faith to stand and wait uh, for God to show up when it doesn't look like your breakthrough is coming. So faith is the golden key. Tell your neighbor it's the golden key. But, but let me say this to you, that unless you first understand grace, you cannot understand faith. Because let me say this, grace is not a doctrine, it's not a teaching, it's not a topic, it's not a module. Grace is a person. And until you understand grace, you'll never be able to walk in faith. So, so people teach religion and tradition and, and you must do this and you've got to do that. And yeah, there's some things we do, but it's always, tithing is, is always a response to the blessing, not to get blessed. See, see, uh, giving money is never a thing of like, I give to get. That's a byproduct going to happen. You get your philanthropists paying 20 grand into charities, but, but they, they got blessing flow happening. They're tapping into a principle they don't know, amen, and they just do it because they want to do good. There was no persuasion, right? Amen. But when we understand that grace is a person, John chapter 1 verse 16 it says, and of his fullness, we have all received and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So if we, until we truly understand grace and truth that comes through Jesus, we cannot live and operate by faith. Because it will always be our works, faith by our faith. It'll always be, how am I doing today? How am I feeling today? How am I responding today? How am I doing in this situation? Rather than going, I know God has this situation and I'm just going to lean on that. Because the reality is, without the help of the Holy Spirit, you and I cannot walk this Christian life out. It's impossible. It's impossible to live a life the way God's called us to live. And I'm not talking about being judgmental or critical or religious or any way. But listen, to live a life that says, Lord, I just want to be more like you. I want to see the kingdom advance through me. Lord, I need the help of the Holy Spirit. I need the help of the Holy Spirit to do what I'm doing. I need the help of the Holy Spirit every, every, every month when we pay bills for this church. To go, Lord, I give it to you. I trust you with it. You do what you want with it. You bring who you need to bring. Amen? It takes faith. But until I have a revelation of the person that I'm doing it for and with, my faith is going to be weak. My faith is going to be nullified. My faith is going to be in my faith, not in the finished work of Jesus. Amen? Amen? Look, even in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 to 16. Let us now therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace in help of time of need. Amen. That mercy is compassion, but that grace is divine influence on the heart and it's unmerited favor. So until we understand that Jesus is the one, he is the doorway. How many know he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. He says, no one comes to the Father except through religion. Sorry, through, through Bible school? Through doing a basics course? Through attending church? Doesn't mean you can't or don't need to. Disclaimer. But it says through Jesus Christ. 
And so and until we understand that grace and truth come through Him, our faith is mere weakness or watered down or in our own ability, not in Him. And, and in, in that, it will affect everything we do. It will affect how we handle our marriage. It will affect how we handle situations and circumstances. It will affect whether we sow or we don't sow. It, it will affect how we, we stand believing for healing or we, we settle for the report the doctor's given us. Amen? Because if I go, I, I've got to get this healing by my faith. <laughs> and I've got to wind this thing up. But man, it's tiring. You can only do it so long. But when you just go, Lord, there's nothing I can do. I'm just going to sit on the finished work and trust you. Amen. That's a lot easier and a lot better than trying to make it happen. That's called the resting place. Amen. So the throne of grace begins in and through Christ. You, you cannot access that throne of grace in time of need. Anybody been in time of need? Anybody needed some, some mercy and compassion? So some grace, some divine influence on the heart, right? I need it every day. Trust me. I need it every day. But you know what? Until I come to that throne room of grace, in other words, I come to the throne. Didn't it say when Jesus had finished, he had gone up to the throne and sat at the right hand of the Father? Grace is sitting there and he's saying, come, you have access to me, the person of grace, I'm the one interceding for you. I'm the one that's going to help you. I'm the one cheering you on. I'm the one that's finished everything. You could say it like this. Grace provides everything faith receives. Grace has provided everything, but faith receives. So my faith doesn't produce something. My faith downloads something. But it's the grace of God, the person of Jesus, that has done everything once and for all. Amen. You could say it like this, that grace, okay, grace is God's response to us. Faith is our response to Him. Amen? So God responded to us with grace, sending Jesus, and, and responds to humankind. God's so loved the world. Not the Pentecostals, the world. <laughs> right? That He gave. The world responds or rejects by faith. Or lack of faith. Amen? And that's important to understand. Amen? So my question is, why is this important? What does it have to do with faith? Well, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9. And, and i got a few more scriptures today than I would usually use. So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw some things out there. But I want to encourage you to go back and spend time meditating on it. Because you, you know what helped me grow? Okay? Uh, people say, you, you've grown a little bit, right? But you know what helped me grow? is I would take the pastor's message every Sunday, Pastor Anthony, when he was preaching, and I'd go pull it apart in a week and go study it. Because if that's the place God's called you, then the nutrients are in the ground. you called to be a palm tree planted in rivers of living water, drawing nutrients from the house that God's called you. It's pointless going and on a Sunday going, I listen to something, and then Monday through Saturday, I don't open my Bible, I don't have a structured reading plan, I, I do nothing, and then come back next Sunday and go, what did, he, what did he talk about last week? What did, what did he talk about last week? That helped me grow. That's called discipleship. That's called following Jesus. It's going, okay, let me go spend time and dig a well for myself. Let me go a little bit deeper. Let me go pull it apart and, and go cross-referencing and dig deeper to get more revelation out of what was preached. Amen? I guarantee you there's stuff I listen back on people, and I, go, I didn't hear him say that when I was there. I just heard something new. Amen? And so I would encourage you with that. But Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9 says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith. So, so my faith doesn't save me. It's the grace of God that saves me. But it's my response to that grace that positions me for salvation to enter. Amen? So I'm saved by grace through faith. Faith is, a, is the mechanism, the key that unlocks everything in the Bible. Everything in the Bible, every principle, every blessing, every resource, everything we need is linked to faith, but it has to come through grace. Amen? Look here. 
And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. I, I hate it when people give testimonies. I detest it when people give testimonies. And there's more I in it than him. I healed. I did that. I, I'm like, really? No, you were a donkey and being used by the one who is the healer, not you. Right? We are just mere, we, we respond to what God is laying on our hearts and go, Lord, I'm just a conduit. That's all I am. But you get all the glory. And so when I walk around talking, you know what? Like I've done this. Like my life has changed because I've done this. I've followed God. I've done this. Now listen, it's the grace of God. Well, yes, you've responded and, and healed it and that's all fine. But li li listen, without Him, without His grace, listen, if His grace is moved from you, you're going to fall down like a heap of dust. Literally. It's the grace of God and Spirit of God that hold us together. And so we don't take the glory. It's not faith in my faith. It's faith in the finished work of Jesus. Amen. And I've got to remember that and keep that in the forefront, lest anyone boast. Amen. Hallelujah. See, faith is the, I've got three keys, right? This is just still the first key. Tell your neighbor, you're still on the first key. But this is an important key, so I'm spending a little bit, little bit more time here. Faith is our key and the title deed. Hebrews 11, everybody should know this one. Verse, uh, verse 1 in the Amplified says, Now faith is the assurance, the title deed, the confirmation of things hoped for, divinely guaranteed, and the evidence of things not seen, the conviction of their reality. Faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by physical senses. Amen. So the definition of a title deed, it's a legal deed or document. How many have ever been in a, in a litigation before? Come on, listen, let's be honest. I have, right? Falsely, right? But how many know when you have legal right, you can stand there boldly going, you can throw what you like at me, it is written. Yes. Or if there's false accusations, you can go prove where it is written. Yes. Come on, anybody been there? Yes. Okay. But there's something about it when you know it is written, when you have a contract, when you have something that you have a legal binding right and you've upheld your part, nobody can come and take away what he's given you. Right? If, I have a, if, if, if my, my vehicle is paid for, right, and somebody comes and says, that belongs to me, I go, sorry, I have the title deed. It's my vehicle. You, you don't have the right to do that. You, you, you can't take it from me because I have legal possession of it. Faith is that legal possession, that guarantee that every single promise in you, if it's in my heart, inscribed in my heart, and I have revelation about it, and I attach my faith, the assurance, Abram was fully persuaded. Therefore, he was called a friend of God. Therefore, he was made righteous. That was before Jesus Romans chapter, I think it was chapter 4 verse 8, I think it is, somewhere in there. Or Romans somewhere. Amen? It's in the Bible. <laughs> Go through Genesis, you get to Revelation, turn back. Right? It's in there somewhere. Trust me. But Abraham, Abraham was fully persuaded. So when I'm, facing, when I'm facing financial situations, God, it is written. It is written. I have a guaranteed title deed, legal assurance. If I'm not being a fool... If I'm not being reckless with my finances and causing self-infliction upon me, right? You said you will meet every one of my needs according to your riches. So guess what? I can rest assured that guess what? He is going to meet every single one of my needs according to his riches in Christ, not mine. If the doctor has given you an ill report, I can go to the word and say, I know a healer. His name is Jehovah Rapha. It is written that over 2,000 years ago, I was healed, made whole, and redeemed, and sanctified. It is written. I have a full assurance of that. But you have to have the full assurance. Amen? And I love that part where, where it says in here, that the conviction of their reality, faith comprehends as a fact what cannot be experienced. Amen? So what are your physical senses? 
Come on, let's do a lesson here. Five senses, right? The five gateways. If I can't see it, if I can't hear it, if I can't speak it, if I can't smell it, I don't know what you're believing for that you have to smell. Anyway, maybe a burger, I don't know, right? But if I can't uh, feel it maybe emotionally, if I can't touch it, obtain it, right? What, is I, what do I default to? It doesn't matter about if I can't see it, if I can't speak it, if I can't declare it, if I can't hear it, if I can't feel it, if I can't smell it. But I'm fully assured that what I've prayed for, that what I'm believing for, that's what's been promised, is on the way. Amen? That's what, things are getting bad. We're in recession. Who cares? Isaac was in recession. He sowed in the same year. He reaped a hundredfold. Come on. Listen, we, we need to believe the Bible or not. And not some pieces and others. We either believe it all or we believe nothing. Amen. I don't know about you. I'm an extremist. Like you can ask my wife. When I like, when I do something, I'm like, I'm like, she goes, oh God, there's everything into it. I remember once saying, you know what? I feel like just moving to like a place like Fiji, opening a dive shop and swimming with fish every day and listening to people blow bubbles. Like, I just, I just want that lifestyle. I want a log cabin. She says, you wouldn't be able to do that. I say, why? She says, you're an extremist. You'll want to run for prime minister or something ridiculous. And that's true. I can't, I can't settle. Like, I, ca I cannot. Since I've been born again, since I've been sanctified, transformed, I can't help it. If I get into an organization or, or a movement or denominator, if I'm involved in anything, I sit back for a while, I go, I can help. Can I say something? Have you thought of this? And then, and then all of a sudden it's like, hey, you want to get involved? No, no, no. <laughs> no. Because I know if I do, I'm, I'm just all in. Right? But that's, that's how we, that's my nature. Good or bad. Sometimes it's bad. Sometimes it's good. But if we can't be all in for this, it's not going to work for us. Amen? It's nothing to do with religion. It's got to do with relationship and principles that work. Amen? You see, the, 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 there's a whole hall of fame of faith in this Bible. Amen? In, in Hebrews, it said, by faith Abel, by faith Enoch, by faith Noah, by faith Abram. Amen? By faith they dwelt in the land of promise. By faith Sarah herself also received and, con and conceived. Right? But it didn't say they were perfect because every one of them along their journey had setbacks. Sarah lied. She caused her husband to be in adultery, birth Ishmael, right? But yet it still says by faith, eventually you get to a place where, okay, I've tried everything in my ability. Now I'm just going to believe you. Yes. I, I've tried to help you along. Anybody try to help God along the way? Yeah. I still try sometimes. Yeah. I, look, I can speed things up, Lord. Like I'm, I'm strategically gifted. Like have you ever considered changing things a little bit? And he like the same thing, that, like that silent, awkward moment. And he's like, listen, like when last did you hang stars in the sky and not let them fall? Right? And I'm like, yeah, I think you're probably a little bit more strategic than I am. I give it to you. Just this once. Right? <laughs> Praise God. Hebrews chapter 12. We're still dealing with faith. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was sent before us, he endured the cross, despising shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Everything starts and ends with the person of grace, Jesus. Our faith to operate in the kingdom is dependent on our eyes fixed on Jesus, fixed on the word of God. Not our opinion, not our emotions, not our feelings, not sight, not smell, right? Don't judge the person next to you. God made them in his image and likeness, <laughs> right? See, everyone's head's turning now. It's like <laughs> Praise God. I love this. There's a guy that's very influential. You will probably all have known him some point in time. His name's Dr. Tony Walter Giro. <laughs> 
He taught me one thing many years ago. And he says, faith has a bigger brother, and his name is trust. So the level of your faith determines the level of your trust. And trust, right, the level you're trusting is the level of peace in your life. If you're in that resting place, that peace place, that means you're in the faith zone. The moment you step out of peace, you're not in the faith zone. Doesn't mean we avoid things. Doesn't mean we just leave things. Doesn't mean we don't be good stewards of things. What it means is we have to get back into the rest zone because that's the faith zone. Amen? Amen? Tell your neighbor, that was number one, faith. Key number two, and I'm going to get through these a little bit quicker. Second key is prayer. Prayer. Matthew chapter 6, verse 8 to 10. I, I, we were singing a song earlier. And I, I, love, I love how God starts weaving the service together. The things that are said, the things that come out in song, the things that come out in communion offering. I'm just sitting there going, Lord, I love it when you just weave everything together. Amen. But he says, therefore, do not be like them. Who's he talking to? The Pharisees. The religious. The Fruit Loops. He's talking to them, right? He says, for your father knows the things that you have need of before you ask him. <laughs> Isn't it amazing you come to God and you come with these big problems and you're like, Jesus, do you know what's happening to me? What they said, what they did, my feelings are hurt. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I saw that coming. I just let it happen to develop some character in you. What are you going to do about it? Right? But, 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 but fine. Uh, the, the, uh, I'm innocent and, and there's this litigation happening. And he's like, and, and speak to the mountain. Speak to the mountain. But, but there's, there's this, this thing happened. Curse it. Curse it. I, I, I said, speak to the mountains. Don't tell me about the mountains. Right? And, and I'm going to show you something yeah, that I was thinking about this morning. It says, in this manner, therefore pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Listen to this. If God already knows your, your needs, well, that, that tells me, and, they say, and Jesus says, don't pray like them, for your Father already knows your needs. Then the conclusion is prayer is not about asking God for your needs. Now, there's seven types of prayer in the Bible, don't get me wrong, and I can teach on all of them. But the foundation, the principle, and sadly, it's almost like God is used like a genie in a box. That when there's a need, it's like take him off the shelf, blow the dust off, and go, I have a need, and I know you're able to help me. I don't mean to be crude, but that almost make him feel like a prostitute. I, I only want to connect, like, uh, only when I have a need. But when I don't have a need, like, you just stay there. Amen. You're all going quiet on me. Amen. So if, if it's not about asking him his needs, could you possibly think that the key, when Jesus said, in this manner pray, our Father... He doesn't first tell him about, hey, repent your sin. That's in the Lord's Prayer. That's in the model. But the first thing is come to him like a father. And the sad thing is, and I was one of these that never had a father growing up in my household. And the problem comes when you haven't had a great example of a father in the household you don't know how to come to the Father in a loving way without condemnation, guilt, or fear that He's going to judge you or slap you. And, and it took me a long time to get a picture of how do I approach this Father? How, how do I approach my Father when I haven't had a, a fatherly figure to go, this is how a loving Father looks like. That's why I'm so passionate about my boy Sometimes interrupts like our conversation, like Morse code in the military back in 1962. 
It's like, say two words, kid. Two words, kid. Can we start again? Because I forgot the first two words. Like, our conversations take a long time. But you know what? I, 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 he's, 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 the, he's the apple of my eye. He's my beloved in whom I'm well pleased. So he has access to the throne of grace and mercy. Literally 24-7, seven days a week. <laughs> Even before you preach at 4.45 a.m., he has access to the throne of grace and mercy. <laughs> the fact that I'm awake and not falling asleep, hanging over the altar right now, is a miracle and the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit in itself. Amen? But Jesus said, yeah, don't pray like them with these long-winded prayers. Sometimes you get around people and it's like, you've got to be careful who you ask to pray for food. Especially when you're hungry. Like, hey, do you want to say grace? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great south land of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the anointing that is falling. We pray for all those brothers and sisters that are lost right now. Jesus, I thank you for back when I was five years old that you intervened. I'm like, shut up. I want to eat my food. Can you just say grace? Be careful who you ask to pray. <laughs> right? I ask, Ezekiel's trained. He knows how to pray. It's like, thank you, Jesus, for this food. Bless our body. Amen. I love it. I love it. The problem is with him, though, is to get him to do that part is, takes a while because he does inspection. Daddy, close eyes. Eyes are closed. Mommy, close eyes. Eyes are closed. Daddy, close eyes. I'm trying to close my eyes, but can you pray? Food's getting cold. Mommy, close eyes. Coco, sit here. I'm like, can you just pray? <laughs> like you're praying well, but just pray the part that we've trained you to pray. Don't worry about the logistics. <laughs> right? But, but, but that's what he's saying. Don't pray long-winded stuff. It's not about the big words. You don't have to recite revelation. Come to the throne room of grace like children before the Father and say, Abba, Father, here I am. I come to your throne room of grace and mercy. You know what I need, but I want to talk to you. I want to build relationship. And the key is what's the purpose of prayer? The foundation of prayer is right there in the beginning as well. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come. The whole thing with prayer is about, Lord, it's about intimacy and relationship and then about aligning our hearts to His heart and seeking His will for our lives as it is in heaven, so too let it be on earth. That's the simplicity of prayer. I went through a long time where I felt that I had to be lying on my face in a cupboard reading, which causes whiplash after a long time and lower back problems, by the way. And then you can't get up properly. It's like you need a healing service just to get up after a prayer meeting with God because you can't move. Now, I'm not, not, I'm not knocking it. There's time for intercession. I'm not talking about intercession. I'm talking about lifestyle prayer. I thought that that's how I had to do it. And if I couldn't do it, I felt condemnation and guilt fall upon me. You know what my prayer is now? Wherever I'm going, when I have a thought, I talk to the Father. Wherever I move, Lord, I, I'm making lunch. I'm like, or making coffee. I'm like, Lord, I don't understand this. What are you doing? Can you explain this to me? Can you show me? It's about that intimacy and relationship. Now I have so much more freedom in my life. And I have so much less condemnation and guilt because I have access to the Father. Amen. I, I never deny my kid. If he wants to hold my hands there in praise and worship or just about before I get up, I'll never deny him access to me because if I can't learn to hear the Father with my boy next to me, how am I training him? If I, if I can't, listen, if, I, if I'm in a worship service and I can't hear the voice of the Spirit while my boy is holding and yanking me off balance and trying to tell me something, how am I going to hear him when I'm out in the marketplace, how, when I'm out in the cafe, when I'm driving, when he says, hey, get into that lane, th 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 something's going to happen, get out of that lane. How am I going to hear him then? And so I say, I'll never deny him. Pastor makes you say, you know, are you okay with him? Yeah, I said, he's my boy. I'd rather have him growing up, yeah, than out there in the world. Amen. And I need to suck it up and learn how to hear the voice of the Lord and have him access at the same time. Amen. And so that's the biggest thing is prayer is about fellowship and relationship. Prayer is not a duty or a formula. 
It's about a covenant relationship that aligns our hearts to his, discovering his will and plans for our life. That's prayer. You need faith to function in the kingdom and you need prayer, intimacy with the Father. I love what Brother Hagen said. He said, um, step number six, I don't have the other five steps, by the way, if you're wondering about those. To receiving answered prayer is in your every waking moment. Think on the greatness of God and his goodness and count your blessings. This will increase your faith. When we focus on the goodness of God, the greatness of God, and we just focus on that, that will increase our faith when we take our eyes off circumstances and situations and we come to him like a loving father. Tell your neighbor the third key I want to talk about. Lock the door. Don't put off your TV. It's for you. We cannot walk in authority until we learn to walk under authority. You cannot walk in authority until you learn to walk under authority. We're in a lawless society that dishonor authority, dishonor leaders, parents, all those things. And some of it's self-inflicted, I get it. But in the general, there's this, this rebellion in society today. And there's no different, let me say this, and it's a global general statement, not applying to everybody, but I believe it's, it's very present in the body of Christ. Right? If it doesn't fit, don't wear it. But in general, the sons of Sceva tried to cast out devils and demons, and they said to them, Peter, we know, Paul, we know, who are you? They were not people of intimacy and, and, and under authority, but they tried to mimic others, and the spirit realm gave them a hiding. Right? We, 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 church is not a game we play. It's a kingdom we operate in. It's real. We can't be one foot shacking up over here when the word says get married. And then on this side, we're trying to walk in authority. I'm, I'm, this is not law bound or legal. I'm just telling you. That's what the word says. If the word says forgive and, 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 and let go, and I'm walking in unforgiveness, and I'm trying to see breakthrough over here, I'm not walking under authority of the word, so I can't walk in authority on this side. The Bible talks about if I'm gossiping and slandering on this side, but then I'm wondering why I'm not having breakthrough this side. You're not under authority. You're not under what the word tells us to do. So how can I live in a place of authority where righteousness, peace, and joy are evident and fruits in my life when on one side I'm doing something that is, is opposing what God tells us to do, but on this side I'm looking for different fruits in my life and I wonder why they're not showing up. Amen? This is not a legal thing. This is a, a, a principle thing. Amen? Look here in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 19. It says, if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Willing and obedient. That word willing is talking about a place of submitting and ready. Am I submitting and ready to what the word says? Or am I selective with what the word says? Because that's going to determine, listen, that's going to determine the goodness of the land I eat. So if my land right now is a bit toxic, I've got to go ask myself, where have I not been willing and obedient in the word because it's showing up in the land I'm eating? Amen? That obedient talks about to discern, give ear, or subservient. So in other words, it's saying this, that I need to discern what's God and what's not God. Amen. I, I need to be in a place that I give ear to what the Spirit of God is telling me and obey it, and then I'm going to eat the good of the land. Sometimes, you know, sometimes we can make bad decisions because we didn't listen to the voice of God and we eat the consequences of it. I often talk about this. I was talking the other day about to somebody uh, a situation uh, in Sydney, something that happened over there with somebody in a church, and they reached out to me asking me advice. And, and they were going through through marriage troubles and problems. And it's like, and this was the thing they said. They said, I, the same person keeps showing up in my lives. And I said this because you don't have a set of core values, and so you take anybody that comes along your way. 
And so what happens is I haven't made a decision. This is the core set of values. This is what I heal to. This is what I obey in my life. Anything that doesn't line up with it, I don't let in my life. So it's not the same thing keeps showing up. It's just you keep accepting the same thing in a different form because you don't really know what you stand for. If you stand for nothing, you fall for everything. Amen? So look here, it, it talks about goodness refers to beauty, gladness, joy, to go well with. So when I get to a place, and this is the Father's heart, it's not, a, it's not from a legalistic point of view. He wants us to eat the good of the land. He's had a picture from, from Egypt going, man, I want you to go into the promised land. A million people never saw it. Only the next generation saw it. The, the very people, the very people God intended to see the promised land never saw it because, why? There was a willingness and an obedience that was lacking. There was murmuring, complaining. Everything that God said, don't do, these people were operating in and they could not enter the promised land. I wonder what promised land for us is being hindered purely because we're not willing and obedient. In our marriages, in our finances, in our ministry, in our businesses, in our careers, in every area. What are the areas? I, I love, I love uh, a pastor that, that was my oversight back in South Africa. He said this. He said, when the voice of God goes quiet on you, go back to the last instruction he gave you. So when God's gone quiet, it's like, oh, I'm not hearing God. I'm not seeing breakthrough. What was the last thing he instructed you to do? Go back and deal with that thing. And I guarantee you the voice of God, you will start hearing him again. Because the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. The more he's resisted, the quieter he gets. And then he sits and he goes, I'm not going to force myself on you. I'm just going to I'm here with you. I want to lead you. But you need to heal to what I'm saying. Look at this in, in Matthew chapter 7, and I'm going to start landing this plane. Verse 21, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. Can I say something? An outward profession of religion, however remarkable, will not bring us to heaven unless there is a correspondent conversion. Yet here's my encouragement to every evangelist. Just because somebody says the sinner's prayer does not mean they converted. Jesus didn't say, get people to say the sinner's prayer. He said, get them to follow him. Make disciples. This is my challenge. If people, listen, I can come to church, have an express. That's why, look, I, I'm all for holy. Like tonight, we're going to have worship night. Come on, who's coming? I'm believing. I love the worship nights. You know why? It's a time we just jump in and go, Lord, whatever. I didn't prepare. I got like nothing on my heart, but what are you going to do? Are you going to show up with healings? Are you going to have a word? What's, I love those moments. But let me tell you something. I'd rather get good Bible, solid teaching that transforms my mind and transforms my life than chase experiences. Because my experience tells me, and what I've noticed in the body of Christ, experiences don't save marriages. Experiences don't transform people. Experiences don't shift things. But transformation and renewal of the mind according to the Word of God, that shifts society. Amen? And it's, and it's proof. I, I'm not against revivals. I'm not against, I'm for it. You've got to heal my heart. But every revival that happened was unsustainable. Come on, you, you guys have been through Bible school. Am I right or wrong? You can tell me I'm wrong. I don't mind. But you know why it was unsustainable? The discipleship follow through. The discipleship follow through. We need it all to come together. We need the evangelists to go in and light a fire and cause a revival and let the Spirit of God move through a place. But if we don't have the back end, the teachers, the pastors, the shepherds, the local churches working hand in hand to create a discipleship mechanism to funnel people in where you can go, now we're going to walk. Now we're going to follow after Jesus. Now we're going to go with Jesus. Now we're going to become disciples of Jesus. Now we're going to look like what he looks like. Now we're going to release the kingdom together. If that's missing, you can have 9,000 salvations in a weekend. Good on you. But I want to know in five years and 10 years, how many of them are still serving the Lord? How many of them, their families have been transformed? 
I'm preaching good right now. Amen? That's what I'm after. I'm after an encounter, but an encounter does not change you. An encounter can waken something, shift something, break off something. The Spirit of God can touch you. I believe that with all my heart. But let me tell you what, until we get to a place where Jesus said, follow me. Jesus never said, say this prayer after me. He said, follow me. Until we follow this, I thank God. Listen, coming out of, coming out of a, 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 a household where my mother raised five, five kids or, or four bro, uh, boys uh, from the age of five years old and, and living through, through tough financial times, having brothers raise me that don't know any better than, you know, they did the best they can, but my brothers basically helped raise me. So what values were put in there with no Christian values, right? What values? Right? And so, so here's this thing. And then I, I have an encounter with Jesus that changes my life. I get the word of God put in my heart. I get people around me that say, follow Jesus. We'll show you how to do it. You know what? I'm so grateful. You know why I'm grateful? I'm going to tell you why I'm grateful because I got a mic and I can. This is why I'm grateful. By me saying yes and saying I will follow Jesus with all my heart, my boy, his, his whole destiny has shifted and moved to a different realm because I said yes. Had I been wishy-washy and gone, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll do this sometime and we'll pick it up sometime and we'll like just see a little bit of this, a little bit, a little bit of the world, yeah, a little bit of this, yeah. You know what? I'm setting him up for Satan to destroy him. Now, he'll still come to an age where he has to make a decision to follow Christ. But if I can be the best version of Abba, to raise him in a way that go, listen, there's no condemnation. You can talk to me about anything. I don't really care. You can talk to me. I've been there. I, I'm on the throne of grace and mercy. There's nothing you're going through that I've probably never been through in my life or experienced or seen or heard or tasted. But you know what? As long as I can, I can be that open relationship and, and I, can, I can try and lead him to the best of my ability, according to the word, to be a follower of Jesus, not a follower of man and the world. He, his probability goes up. His probability goes up. He, he's still gonna have to deal with his flesh. But, but if I can raise that probability, I can, I can impact his children and their children. That, that one day may be like Jacob, his children, my grandchildren, may have an encounter one day wherever they are and God shows up like he did to Jacob and says, I'm, your, I'm the God of your grandfather, Abraham. I, I'm the God of your grandfather, Sean. And, and I've got to, I want to talk to you in that place you're at. Amen. That's why I'm, I'm in this for legacy. Every seed we sow, everything we do has to be beyond us. It has to be beyond this room. It has to be 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. If we're not thinking like that, we're actually not thinking like God. He's a generational God. Can I just say this? Do you know this? The amount of promises that were given in the Bible, do you know most of the people that were given promises never saw the fulfillment of them? Abraham never saw the fullness of his promise, but we see in the fullness of his promise. David never saw the fullness of his promise, but Solomon built the temple. Sometimes, let me just say this, I want to talk to you and I want to encourage you in this moment. I didn't plan to, but I'm just going to stay here for a moment. Can I stay here for a moment? Sometimes the promises you have need you to move beyond selfishness to see it manifested but a compelling heart to move towards it with all your heart, whether you see it or not. Because more than likely, if it doesn't reach you, you're setting up the next generation for what God had in your life. And sometimes selfishness, because it's our vision, our dream, our ambition, our reputations. We think that if we don't see it, we've failed or God's failed us. If you don't start looking that God is a God of legacy generations, and going, hey, everything he's shown me for this church, maybe, maybe I don't see it all. But I'm going to do my best to stay so focused and grab a hold of that word he's given and that picture he's given. And I'm going to fight with everything in me for the next generation. And that if I don't see it all, that they'll be able to walk in and pick up and it'll be a lot easier for them than for me. But that means dying to self so that the next generation can reap the harvest. Amen.
Can I close with one story quickly? In a bustling town, Thomas, a talented but restless craftsman, sought a higher purpose for his work. He embarked on a quest with three keys his father gave him, each engraved with these words, faith, prayer, and obedience. With the key of faith, he inspired a group of builders to see their church as a divine masterpiece. Their renewed belief transformed their simple structure into a beacon of hope. The key of prayer he offered to a divided city, teaching leaders to seek guidance beyond their wisdom. As they prayed, unity and peace bloomed like a rare flower in hardened soil. Lastly, the key of obedience he gave to farmers fighting barren lands. They learned to work in harmony with nature and their obedience turned scarcity into abundance. Returning home, Thomas realized that these keys were not just gifts for others, but also for himself. He infused his creations with these kingdom principles, and his work transcended artistry, touching lives and showcasing the kingdom's power. Through faith, prayer, and obedience, Thomas found his purpose, proving that the kingdom flourishes in us before it can flourish through us. Can I have the worship team come up? Amen. There's three applications that you can take away today. I, I'm a practical, I'm a practical person. I like to keep it simple. If I can't do it in the natural, I'm like, well, I don't want to know about it. But how do I, how do, I do this? Key number one, faith. If you want to build your faith and stir your faith, get to know Jesus. Get to know the word and get to know the person of grace. It's not about religion. It's not about law. Listen, I'm speaking from testimony. I, I don't have time, but I, I can share testimony after testimony, things that God has done that just having the wife I've got is a testimony of what God can do if you put this first. When, when, when I got saved, God said, don't look at another woman, don't touch another woman until I show you the woman I've called for you. And I made a pact with God that I would not. And it was only a year or two later that the Lord revealed I'd known Pastor Tony and Kathy before I knew Megan. And, 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 and I was serving in ministry with them before I even knew my wife. They were the pastors involved in Rama in South Africa. And I made a decision, Lord, until you give me somebody that loves worship, that is holy, that is pure, that is all these things, and, and forgive me for my background, for my mistakes. I, I won't. And it was a year or two later, he showed her to me. And I thank God. But it wouldn't have been if I didn't heal to this. Amen. But get to know the word. Get to know the person of grace. And realize we don't walk by, by, by sight, but we walk by faith. Listen, that doesn't mean switch your brain off. <laughs> Please don't. God gave us a brain to use it, right? Spend well, save well, invest well, do well, be wise, love your wives, love your husbands, do practical stuff, happy wife, happy life. There's wisdom in that alone, right? Don't walk by faith, unless you'll be fine. Yeah, see how that goes. <laughs> not by faith, not by sight. Amen. The second key is develop intimacy with God and the Holy Spirit talk to him don't talk to him in King James please dear God don't ever let me hear you doing that unless you talk King James to everyone but even then I'm going to pray for you just talk to him wherever you go be real he's your father and he loves you you may not have a picture of a perfect father for whatever reason Many people don't, I never. But get to know him for who the Bible says he is, not what people says he is. Amen. And the third application is make a decision to honor, obey, and submit to the word. When I'm doing something or find myself in a compromising situation, ask the question, Lord, what do you say about this situation? 
What do you say about me slandering somebody? What do you say about me being offended with somebody? What do you say about me, you know, withholding something? What do you say about me in my thinking? What do you say about me in these actions? What do you say about me in this situation? What do you say about me? Not what's the opinion of somebody else. I've had people in adultery say they prayed about it and God said it was okay. And I'm like, really? I'm serious. The things I've heard, listen, thank God we have a non-disclosure with heaven because it would shock you. But just go back to what does the Bible say? Don't overthink it. Like if it says it, okay, Lord, I'm going to do my best to fulfill. I need your help, Holy Spirit. Help me live according to this. Amen? And that's not legalistic. Think about this. When you go into a different country, it has a set of laws. And if you go in there with your laws, let's use common sense. Let's go to America and drive on the left-hand side of the road. That's not a do it. That's just an analogy. What's going to happen? It ain't going to go well with you. Right? Right? It's the same thing. We're coming from a place and a realm and a dimension where there's some great things. The Bible says that, you know, there's many good things, but not all things are profitable. I want to know what's profitable. So when I, when I come into the kingdom and into relationship with God, I've got to go, okay, I'm coming with all this stuff, ways of thinking, ways of doing, ways of thinking I'm right. But if we're going to be a people that seek first the kingdom, and his way of doing and his way of being right, well, then I've got to align my ways to his ways. And then what does it say? We eat the good of the land. Father, I just thank you right now. I thank you for every single person, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would speak to, speak to us wherever we are. Lord, you're a loving Father. You're a gracious God. You are the person of grace. You are the person of truth. And we just thank you that you lead us and guide us in Jesus' name. That every single seed that's gone out, Lord, we declare that it will produce in our lives, those watching by live stream and those in the auditorium, optimum healed. I'm not worried about 30, 60, but I declare 100 fold for every single person here, Lord. I thank you, Lord. It's not my might, not power, but it's your might and by your power and by your spirit. I pray that you saturate this word with your power in the hearts of every single person here. In Jesus' name. If you're in this auditorium right now, every head bowed, every eye closed, just for a moment, I don't want to take for granted that every single person here says, yeah, I've given my life, I've committed my life to, to Jesus. He said there in, in Matthew that you've got to declare, Lord, Lord. But let me ask you this question. Do you know him as Lord and Savior? Have you committed your life to follow him wholeheartedly? If that's you in this place right now, or even by live stream, can you just raise your hand and say, would you pray with me? I, I, wanna, I wanna commit my life to the Lord. I wanna commit my life to the kingdom. I wanna change my life. Maybe I've backslidden, maybe I've been a bit cold, but is anybody here that would say pray with me? Everybody here. On, on, on the train of grace. Can we pray this prayer for maybe, maybe somebody by live stream? It's simple. It's not religion. I just say, Lord Jesus, forgive me. I never knew any better. But today I do. I believe you died for me. You shed your blood for me. And you rose again. I ask you to come into my heart, to be my Lord, to be my Savior. Help me to be your disciple, to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that by live stream, if you're watching right now, on the screen there's a little invitation with our, our website. Would you go on there and let us know so we could uh, be in contact with you and somebody could pray with you and just encourage you for a moment. It's not about recruiting you to a church. But I do encourage being in a good Bible-based church that will help, led by the Spirit. Um, but we just want to pray with you and encourage you. If you could do that, that would be awesome.
Hey, I'm so glad that you enjoyed the message today. And uh, if you prayed the prayer, the sinner's prayer, the salvation prayer, I, I just want to encourage you. Today, you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. All things are passed away. All things have become new. If you prayed that prayer, you're a child of God. You're an heir of God. And we want to help you. We want to help you on your journey. So can I ask you to go onto our website? The link is there right now. Uh, just send us a message and somebody will get in contact with you just to give you a free gift to pray with you and to encourage you on your journey. God bless. We look forward to journeying with you. See you soon.